Hi, uh, thank you all. I know we're getting towards the end of the afternoon now, so um, thank, thank you all for your presence here still. Um, yeah, so going to talk a little bit about, I guess, the mixture of data science and sustainability, so nicely led in, obviously, by the, a lot of the previous speakers and, and what you've heard earlier today. So essentially, this is, look, how do you, how do you bring scientific data in um, that's, um, that you can structure in such a way as to be able to interrogate it and, and run scientific models on that. So I'm just going to talk about a couple of use cases on that and, and um, how, we've, how we approach that, this. Um, so, yeah, so one of these projects, uh, Glowpack, uh, it's called, uh, Eva mentioned, so essentially this is looking at sustainable packaging and how can, we, how can we increase the use of sustainable packaging in society? So they're in early stage TRL technology readiness levels right now. Um, so there's a, in the EU project to help them come along the, the development cycle and bring them into use. Um, so nice example here um, of some wheat and it's actually just straw from the wheat, which is essentially a byproduct, and a PLA, which is a bio-based polymer, and how they can be integrated to um, produce some food packaging. Um, so, so uh, bringing bringing these together is, um, you know, looking at the whole supply chain along this. So, who are they? the packaging producers, even the polymer producers, right along to the food business operators and then to the consumers. You know, these have to be tactically nice and they have to be able to perform. Um, so how do, you, how do you understand and analyze that so that, you know, you can keep food safe and keep costs right and, you know, look at, you know, integrate the circular economy into this. So, so essentially our role in this is, is harvesting those data sets and, um, enabling kind of a safe, secure environment for competitive companies to be able to put that data in one place and then for us to be able to, to run the models on that. Um, so, you know, so essentially we, we host the, those data sets and the models. So you know, the food business operators look at their requirements from a quality and safety perspective being two primary along, along with the various other aesthetics as well. And then on the other side of the equation, you have all of these polymer producers, packaging producers, and they have different performance characteristics. And, you know, th these are non-linear relations. So you need models in the center of this when um, essentially when a, a company inputs their, their requirements into this. So we've designed a decision support system then um, that can look at this. So, you know, kind of getting under the hood a little bit in, in terms of, of how this works. So, you know, you have the, the client layer who essentially is the user and they input their parameters and this is where the data will come back out so they can visualize as well. Um, uh, the, the structure the query layer then to be able to interrogate, ask the intelligent questions in the right way. You know, what, what, did, what, what does this translate in terms of the data sets which are over um, uh, on the opposite side? And then you've, you're multiple multiple models then required in order to analyze and interrogate that data depending on the specific query. So bringing all that together in one platform enables uh, the food um, business operators essentially to be able to input that data. Um, you know, we can automate some of these things, like for example, the price is, is um, there's an, an API, essentially an automated um, input for that. So obviously it's a key parameter and that's a highly variable parameter. So being able to integrate you know, allow a, a user to create a particular scenario that can um, determine how do they how do they want the particular performance of their product and and key key tech you know scientific parameters in that as well. So you know, very simply, n n not too many fancy graphics required, but essentially you get back a ranked list um, of how these um, packaging materials perform. Um, given all the particular scenarios. So sustainability obviously being a, a key score and that's one of the, the key factors. So multiple universities involved in this, um, you know, developing um, the various different models. I, I need to give credit to Maeve as well, um, who's, uh, who's one of the, the leads uh, in CREM on this uh, technology. So um, if we look at one of the particular models in this scenario, just to deal drill a little bit deeper behind the actual models behind this. Um, so 
obviously if you're bringing new materials onto the market that are in contact with food, you need to understand what's the risk associated with that. So this is actually built on a previous European project called FACET, um, which essentially was looking at additives um, and um, other contaminants that, that are in food stuff, but also adhesives and inks and uh, items and, and actually the packaging materials themselves and how, how they how, how do those contaminants essentially um, move through the food packaging and come into contact with the food? So this is a, a large complex project that looked at bringing a lot of competitors from various different stages along the food chain um, or supply chain um, in the food industry um, to supply their data um, and bring that all onto one interface. Um, so we've since taken that model and, and brought it onto the cloud. There's obvious benefits to that. I don't need to explain that to, to this audience. Um, and essentially then, we, the migration model itself um, is two, two get, kind of getting into the science here now, but two key parameters in this, the diffusion and the partitioning. So the diffusion um, essentially is the rate at which particles move through a, a piece of material and then the partitioning is essentially the barrier in between that prevents the movement so essentially you, you stack all of these up together and the sink medium being in this case is food but it could actually this also works for like wearables for example so you know people are interested in looking at what migrates through a, um, a, a strap of a watch and how and the sink medium in this case actually would be would burn directly into the human body so some complicated equations that we have scientists to, to figure out, but um, some, some of the key parameters here, um, one of the big values, I guess, of the FASA project was that uh, the coefficients here were experimentally derived. So like there was a four-year project where experiments were set up to simulate and measure um, actual physical movement of migrants through materials. And um, so that was all catalogued and, you know, which becomes quite complex because at different temperatures, the rate of diffusion is different. So, um, and different polymers and different mediums. So, so that data set now exists um, and is available uh, for users. Um, so, and, and in, term, in terms of being able to figure out how is your packaging going to perform, is it going to keep, so adhesives and inks essentially are, can have quite, quite a number of toxins in them, is it going to keep those away from the food stuff? And even if they do come true, how, how much of it comes true? So very quickly to click down through, you kind of get to see uh, essentially, this is uh, the simulating a migrant moving through the different layers and how you might visually, very simply visualize it as it moves through and essentially comes towards steady state um, where you see uh, the, the drop off in quantity of that migrant at, at each different level uh, right through. Um, so, okay, now, now we understand what has moved through the packaging and has come into contact with the food stuff. Then we need to understand okay, what's, how are humans exposed to this? So, so there's, you know, there's different use cases for, our, uh, for, for um, populations and there's different ways in which you can consider them um, and how those demographics are broken down, as mentioned. So essentially, there's data sets that exist on, on what people eat and what chemicals are in those foodstuffs. So essentially, we, we, they're very large data sets, but we bring those together to understand what the exposure is to the, to the population. So as I mentioned, data sets and the chemical concentrations, so you end up then with a distribution of exposure. So very briefly, to understand the, the, um, the consumption habits, um, we focus on one individual, just as an example, we look at what they actually eat, usually on a 24-hour recall. Uh, so we have an um, we have an understanding of the, the frequency of what they eat, various products, the amount that they eat, and then the different uh, con chemical concentrations. So you, you can imagine that this, all when you start to stack up all of this, the, the volume of data really explodes because you're looking at so many different chemical contaminants at different percentages. And then you start to layer in more and more people into it and, and what they consume. Um, so I'm running out of time here rapidly, so I'm trying to get through this quickly. Um, so, so once you have a, a population, then you can start to rank them in terms of who are the most likely to be exposed to the maximum amount of a particular chemical or a group of chemicals, however you want to classify it. So, 
yeah, so if you, if you have enough, like many thousands, then you can start to um, graph this out. Or, um, so a normal distribution, nice, easy, easy one to understand. But essentially, you can see where where are the entities that you need to be concerned about? Like, you know, this is at, at the moment showing 99 uh, percentile. So anything, so essentially what we're looking at here in this scenario is that there's only 1% of the population that would exceed the maximum dose if that's what in this case was deemed as the hazardous amount of a chemical. So essentially that's how you can start right from understanding the chemical concentrations right through the people who are exposed to that and how they... Um, how they come into contact with that. So, yeah, so making data available, um, competitors making data available in, in a kind of, in a secure and confidential environment is, is essentially has been the enabler of this. Um, you know, when you go right back to the, the structure of the polymers, and there's so many div different various th variances there, the structure of the packaging material, and how <coughs> that results right out in, into a, um, your, your migration model. Um, so, a couple, couple of takeaways, I guess, in terms of bringing, bringing complex data together, um, being able to scientifically cl classify it in such a way that it's, it's not just like sentiment. It's like you have to get right into understanding, you know, exactly the right units in the right quantities and in, in the right way to be able to um, um, execute those calculations so you get accurate results out. So, so that's, um, and then enabling the right people to view that in the right way or in being able to anonymize data so competitors can't reverse engineer back out the information um, is, is essentially really key enablers in helping companies to bring unusual and different materials into the market, um, like, like the sustainable packaging. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Um, I have a time for like a very quick question, sure. if, you, if you can keep the answer quick. Um, we know that I, I find that fascinating because I feel like, uh, especially in this day and age, we're much more aware of how sustainable our packaging is, you know, we're going to the shop, a little analogy, and we're coming home and most of the stuff is just going straight in the bin, you know, you're just unwrapping and, and putting it in the bin. Um, so this is really, really important uh, technology and, and research that needs to be done. I'm just wondering, what is the time scale for something like this uh, the from the conception of the new product packaging to the actual like scaling out to market? Is, 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 is it going to take so, a long time? So um, a, lot, a lot of these kind of products are, are rapidly coming onto the market. PLA is already being used. So a lot of it is about, I guess, designing to meet the, the, the minimum set of requirements. Mm. You know, a lot of packaging right now is way over-engineered, but people are used to that and it's safe and it's cheap, so it's easier to do that. So if you want to be able to if people are comfortable with going back to the minimum requirement, well then actually this isn't that far away. But mm. one other tiny comment as well is that actually the whole recycling industry is in a bit of a disaster at the moment. <laughs> so, you know, there really has to be significant focus put on reducing and reusing, the, you know, back to that old thing we all learned as kids. So, you know, that, that, that whole industry is, you know, is essentially collapsing around us right mm. now. Um, so, yeah, big focus needs to go into that to, you know, for us all to have a better society. Yeah. Well, there's hope, right? You're there's doing hope. the work there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thank Brendan again. Thank, thank you. you very much. Cheers. <laughs>